Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. You're very welcome. My name is Justin McCarthy, and uh, you're very welcome to the fifth in a series of six spring webinars that have taken place on FarmersJournal.ie over the last two months. Big thanks out to a big shout out to our sponsors, Active Farm Insurance and Chanel Animal Health for the support with this series. And as ever, ladies and gentlemen, over the next hour and a half, we want as much interaction from our audience as possible. So please feel free to send us in your questions to webinar at FarmersJournal.ie or, of course, on WhatsApp 086 836 6465. Delighted tonight to be joined, ladies and gentlemen, by my colleagues Adam Woods. Uh, Aidan Brennan, Darren Carty, and from Tullamore Farm, Sean Diver. Over the next hour and a half, we'll be talking everything from grass, silage, fertilizer, and the new schemes that are available to farmers in terms of uh, the multi-species wards, tilly schemes, and whatnot. First up, um, we're going to shoot across to Tullamore Farm, where Adam Woods caught up with Sean Diver, I suppose, to get a sense of what has been done differently on the farm this year. Okay, Sean, we're here on Tullamore Farm. It's the end of March. Just to take a little bit of a rewind back, what, what have we been doing here over the last couple of weeks in relation to, I suppose, fertiliser applications, fertiliser purchases on the grazing ground? We'll just start off with the grazing ground. Yeah, look, we've, I suppose, you know, we're still putting an emphasis on that early fertiliser to get, you know, get a bit out anyway, to get grass going. Um, we have 60 acres covered um, with a half bag of urea um, to the acre, and we also covered uh, 20 acres of grazing ground with slurry um, the first week of February as well. Um, look, you know, we, we'll, we'll hope to get the whole farm covered with urea within the next couple of weeks. We're just waiting on a bit of rain. It's a dry week ahead, so we just want to make sure we're getting the maximum kick out of that fertiliser this year, especially with the way prices are. Will you try and come in there with I know your, your trailing shoe there with the, with the story? Will you try and come in there with the trailing shoe after some of them grazings, or will you will you leave that to urea? Um, yeah, well, some of the tanks, I suppose, there's there, they made of a bit more water in them now. Some of the tanks that we emptied, there was water going back into them, and you know that's kind of watery slurry. That could be a good option, maybe you know to go back out after grazed paddocks and just to keep you going for maybe an extra grazing between urea, um, you know. But I think like there's only so much to be gained nitrogen value from slurry, really. Mm. So you know when the stocking rate is high, I think the the, the better urea is going to pay. I suppose you also want to keep a lot of that slurry for your silage ground if you can at all in terms of you know all the P and K coming from the slurry for your silage ground once once you close up silage ground. Yeah, absolutely. Like we're going to come. We're We'll close up 50 acres anyway for the first cut, and uh, you know we'll be looking to go out there with you know two and a half, maybe three thousand gallon of uh, slurry on on the lower P and K paddocks anyway, so three thousand gallon. How does that differ to last year in terms of are you a little bit later going with fertilizer? Are you a little bit cautious about going out with fertilizer this year to make sure you're going to get the right bang for your buck once coming out there? Yeah, I suppose it, look a little bit later, all right. Um, but you know we ha we had reasonable growth as well over the winter. It's been a relatively mild winter, and we had reasonable growth um, right through the winter months. So there's you know a decent cover out on the drier half of the farm so we weren't just as pushed maybe as getting out there and trying to get it moving just as quick as we would have been in the past um, and you know we're really watching the weather minding the soil temperatures just making sure that your is going to get a maximum kick like just in relation to silage ground, what we talked about there in terms of getting the story, what, what, what's happening to that silage ground at the moment? Are you grazing off that silage ground with the aim of closing it up sort of first week of April or what's the plan? That silage ground would tend to go to the sort of the wetter half of the farm with the silage um, because we're not going to get out there in February, early March to graze that. So what I do is I tend to graze off the wetter land over the winter with the sheep. Uh, they'll do minimal, minimal damage to that wetland over the winter. And you know that's drying out nicely now, so hopefully by the end of the week we should be well able to travel that, get the, the slurry out on it, and you'll get it fertilised up uh, first week of April. So the aim with that is to, we'll say, yeah, if it close it off first week of April with an end of May cut, and that's your good quality yeah. silage. That you're not going to, we we'll say, deviate from that this year in terms of bulking up a silage, a, a quality, a, you know, a big pit of silage. You want that to be maintain the quality of that silage this oh, year. Absolutely, because you know we're not only looking at uh, a time of high fertiliser prices, we're probably looking at ration next winter going to be a high price. So the, the quality of silage was never more important. Um, yes, maybe in the second cut for suckler cows in our situation, we can bulk up a bit, fill the pit, might need that good quality. But that first cut, I want super quality stuff for our weanlands where I can cut down that ration price and for sheep as well because ration is going to be an issue next winter, I think. Just moving on in, in terms of managing, I suppose, a turnout. Um, we're here, as I said, the end of March. What have you out at the moment and, and how is that going at the moment? Uh, 38 cows and calves out in two bunches. Um, we just let out 20 cows and calves yesterday. Um, the, the rest of them have gone up to the out farm, the drier land. We keep the, we try to turn them out around the house for ease of getting them back in if we have any problems. 
Um, we have 20 maiden heifers out, going to let out the rest of them tomorrow, so there's 45 in total in that bunch. And uh, we're turning out yos and lambs as a card, and, you know, as we're lambing. So there's there's, tw there's 30 yos and lambs out at the minute. So the thinking is that none of that stock will have to come back in. We'll say cows and cows are out now. They'll be staying out because they're getting really good weather at the moment. They'll be good and hardy, and unless it's a disaster, they'll, they'll not come back in. Yeah, I don't think they'll have to come back in. And, uh, you know, space around the yard doesn't allow for a whole lot to come back in anyways. But I, I think we're over the, you know, when the land dries out here, you know, around this area, you, you tend to be able to stay out and, you know, you'll keep them out with good grazing management as well, you know, keep them moving. In terms of managing things, as it was in relation to grassland management, you're really well set up in this farm with roadways and paddocks and I suppose that's a message maybe we need to get across to people that are watching in tonight in terms of that you will grow more grass in a paddock system. Tell me how you manage your grazings in terms of how long you're spending in a paddock and, and how you're moving on. Yeah, look, the paddocks are, they're, they're key on any system, I think, because you know, we have the whole farm set up now in the sort of five acre paddocks that all can be divided again with a, with a, a strip wire or a temporary fence. And we're sort of going in, look, you're going into those covers of around 1,500, 10 centimetres of grass. That's the ideal cover. We're spending about three days in the paddock and stay moving and we should be back within three weeks, you know. And that's just the key for farmers thinking because, you know, we, we talk a lot about maybe measuring of grass and how we grow grass. That's important, yes, but I think on the beef side of the house, maybe we're a bit slow to take up maybe the measuring of grass, but we really need to put a focus this year especially on how we graze that grass because by putting in those paddocks or putting up a strip wire or the reel and the pigtails, you'll grow probably more grass and you'll probably find that you will use less fertiliser as well. Okay, Sean, thanks very much. Adam, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll start by maybe, maybe going to you first. So really taking from that clip, the plan is really continue uh, as normal and, 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 and when I mean that I don't mean that you're just going to regard disregard what's happening out there but you're still going to use fertilizer and you're still going to dry, try and drive on grass growth Absolutely, Justin. That's a really important message to get across. I suppose tonight we can we can all get caught up, I suppose, with what's happening and how that's going to change things. But we have a high stocking rate in Tullamore, as has a lot of farms throughout the country. We're not going to grow grass without spreading fertilizer. And while it's very hard to stomach the fertilizer prices, we can't just stick our heads in the sand and think the grass will grow without it. Um, it's still, you know, very, very, I, 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 I use the language right here, it's not very, very cheap, but it's still chippy cheap relative to, to concentrate at 350 a ton. If you think about it, I think a ton of nitrogen will say there's 270 kilos, a ton of can, 270 kilos of nitrogen in that in that ton of can. It, that has the capability of growing maybe somewhere between 11 and 13 ton of grass. It will say a ton of concentrate coming in at 350. That's a ton of dry matter, you know. So it's 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 a good way of maybe comparing the two in terms of what amount of feed you can grow from that ton of fertilizer versus the amount of feed you have in the yard from a ton of meal. Like people at the moment are saying, oh, I'd be way better buy meal and feed on the cattle inside. You're actually not in terms of the repayment that you'd get from spreading that fertilizer out on grass is is, is an awful lot bigger than than you will have from from feeding that meal. And and Adam, in terms of in in, in terms of funding that, uh, and Aidan, I'll, I'll maybe come to you on the dairy side of the house in this in a minute. But just just give an example, like what financial uh, demands were on Tullamore Farm there in terms of actually going out uh, and buying that fertilizer if you're going to use the same amount of tons. How much more money are you going to have to put in the table? Sure, it's huge. It's double, Justin. We, we were up at sort of 19,000 last year for a fertilizer bill. We'll be across 40,000 this year for a fertilizer bill. And it's it's absolutely massive. And I suppose, look, at Tullamore maybe is a little bit bigger than a lot of, it's a lot bigger than a lot of farms out there. Um, But I've been talking to a lot of farmers in the last three weeks. And, and what they've been doing is maybe, you know, if a cow wasn't in calf or a cow lost a calf, instead of keeping that cow now over the next couple of months and selling her in the back end of the year, uh, she's went to the mart and maybe some liquidate some of that stock for, for liquidate stock that we're going to be sold anyway. I'm not saying liquidate breeding stock, but but liquidate stock. Maybe you might sell some wheelings a little bit earlier. It, it's definitely most important, especially silage fertilizer. Um, you know, and, and we're, we're talking today now about silage fertilizer because we've had good weather, especially in the northwest. We've had a good two weeks. Ground is dry. A lot of slurry gone out. It's really really important. There's a great chance there now this weekend basically to get that fertilizer out on that silage ground and make sure that, that you. I guess merchants are looking for that money up front. In the past, Justin, on those smaller dry stock farms, what we would have seen happening was that the, the farmer would have bought the fertilizer in the spring, would have sold cattle during the summer, paid for it, would have bought the fertilizer on credit. Merchants, and I look at this, maybe rightly so, I suppose they have a lot of cash out in terms of buying in that product. They're looking for money up front on that. So 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 farmers have to find that money to, to come up front for that for that fertilizer. 
So your advice there, Adam, is it's not a year to carry freeloaders. Thankfully, the, the price of beef, I just read, reading your trend there earlier, you're up for to 4 90 euros a kilo base for prime and obviously back a bit for cows. But there's a good demand out there. And what you're saying to farmers is maybe don't carry any freeloaders. If you slip the calf this year, this is the year to cash you're in and maybe use that cash to, to, to help, help bolster the fertilizer. Just before I come to you, Adam, in case I forget, I want to come back to you. The, the piece you had in the journal, oh, was it two or three weeks ago in terms of uh, analyzing your silage or your slurry? That, that was a very important piece. Maybe just share some of that data with uh, with our listeners here this evening because it was quite concerning. Yeah, so it's, it was a lot lower on Tullamore than, than we would have said. You know, you're, you're talking sort of 6, uh, 5, uh, 30 in terms of maybe you haven't, you know, if you're going out there spreading with a flash bit, maybe you get 9, 5, 30 on a, on a, on a 1,000 gallons or, or spreading with a trail and chew. But we were down an awful lot lower. We were down as low as sort of 2 and 3 for the P and, and also down as far as 5 and 6 for the K. So it, it was a lot lower than maybe Chagas, you know, standard, you know, guidelines are, are showing there. So, and like we, we would have a, a shed in Tullamore that we would have expected to have very good story out of it because we're feeding bulls down there a decent amount of meal while they may not be an ad lib until this point now the slurry still would have been five or six kilos the dry cow shed you might have expected them be in terms of silage just going into those dry cows that you would have a lower quality of slurry we were quite disappointed with that and, and we have to make up the difference now with so in, in terms of farmers out there in terms of making up those differences with the slurry you need to be conscious of and look at testing is, is the be all and end all in terms of getting what p and k is in that story it's important to do that because every farm will differ on those values. Just quickly tell us, Adam, how do you test slurry? Where do you get it tested? Anybody thinking about getting it done? Yeah, so FBA in Waterford is testing it. Um, it's, it's important that it's a mixed sample and that therein lies a little bit of a problem because generally on a dry stock farm, you'll pull in the contractor on the morning, you're spreading it um, and, you, and you'll, you'll he'll agitate it and you'll spread it out. So uh, we had to agitate a tank on Tullamore, I guess, to get that sample just to make sure we'd a, we'd a, we'd a, we'd a valid sample. So a little bit more difficult maybe on a lot of farms in, t- in terms of getting that 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 sample getting a uniform sample because you have to agitate beforehand what's it cost uh, i think it's somewhere around 60 or 70 euros as a sample it's not cheap um but it's 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 quite uh, it's quite expensive but probably worth it in the long run what in uh obviously again maybe similar on the on the beef side maybe even a bit stronger milk prices are good uh there's obviously cash flow is just starting to roll into dairy farms now at this stage but just talking to a a dairy farmer was it yesterday i think it's february milk check albeit low volumes i think was at 55 56 cent a liter so there's a bit of positivity out there in the market but again like like i'm sure adam's experiencing there's a there's big fertilizer bills to be paid yeah and i suppose it's, it's interesting what adam was saying about the you know the, the cash flow side of it most of the dairy farmers i was speaking to the workers are telling them that they want money up front but in most cases, they're actually, you know, they're not actually coming looking for it then, you know, when it comes. So there is still a lot of fertilizer on credit in dairy farms, I would say. Now, look, if you're buying it off your co-op, they have, they have first refusal over, over your milk account, you know. So it's not as though it's a, it's a risk for them as such. And they'll, they'll, they'll get it whenever they want it. But, um, yeah, look, it's, it's a big problem. Justin, I think you can kind of divide dairy farmers into three categories. There's, there's, there's a, probably a third that have, you know, a good, good uh, they have fertilizer in the yard. Uh, bought, you know, didn't necessarily buy it cheap, but they have it in the yard for maybe the next uh, six months or most of this growing season. There's a third end that they're looking for at the moment, and there's a third end that are probably, you know, maybe heading the sand a small bit. Um, and I'd be more concerned about them than than the, than the other two categories because, you know, as Adam rightly said, if, if you don't spread fertilizer, you're not going to get the grass yields, you're not going to get the, the, the silage yields, and you'll end up then in a right little bit of a pickle um, next winter, you know. Mm. I'm obviously it, it may be saving a penny losing a pound aid and overall that if you have to go out and replace silage next uh, next autumn next spring with with concentrate yeah it just doesn't make sense and I mean I think people recognize that I, I suppose the feeling all along is that fertilizer prices were going to fall um maybe that was the, that was the feeling and you know we would have you know, maybe some of us would have felt that ourselves prior to the the war in Ukraine. But when that happened, the whole dynamics changed, and they change now. For you know, it's not going to happen. It's not going to come right overnight. Even if there's you know peace declared, uh, we're here. We're here in this now for the long haul. I'd say um, there's there's at least twelve months of, of chaos on on fertilizer markets, and no matter what happens. So I think uh, farmers need to protect their own businesses. If that means spending more money on uh, fertilizer now in order to have enough feed, it's better to have the feed in the yard. Like the last thing you want is not to have winter feed. It's just such a, it's such an, an intrinsic part of the business. Um, it's, it's it's just so critical to have it. So I think if, you know, 
whatever way you can get the, get your hands on the fertilizer, uh, whether that's borrowing money to do this year, just to get it. Um, obviously, look, stock is an issue. If you've surplus cows and you've too many cows for the land area you have, then then something strategic needs to happen in terms of reducing cow numbers. But like for the most area farmers, it'll pay them to spread fertilizer, as you said, milk prices is high. Um, and thankfully, it's a sector that's you know delivering strong returns at the moment. Um, and to be ashamed to see maybe the profit potential that's in this year eroded by the fact that you can't get access to winter feed or your and the mental stress and turmoil that caused by being short of silage is just mm. not worth it. People remember back to 2018 when we were there's a lot of uncertainty. And back then, if you could throw money at growing grass, you would, but the weather prevented us from growing grass. So we don't want to repeat that um, if we can at all. Aidan, is there any maybe are we lucky that 2018 happened? Because I do get this sense, and even driving around Adam the, the West uh, actually at the weekend and being on a couple of farms, dairy farms on Monday. Uh, guys, the cows are out the grass and the silage blocks aren't empty. Uh, there's a good heel of silage left. Has has there maybe been a pre- bit of preparation going in after the scars of 2018? And guys have been saying to themselves, having a, having a, 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 a heel of silage left at the end of the year necessarily is not a bad thing. Oh, definitely on the dairy side anyway. That was the big lesson from 2018. Have a reserve. A lot of farmers put money into getting that reserve. They actually built extra mm. silage pits so they have space to put it. That's going to stand to them now. But like, there's an opportunity cost to that silage, and replacing it is still expensive. Mm. So like, um, it's good to have it, but but by by no means would you get you know could you skip a year, especially on, on most farms anyway. You couldn't skip a year. Um, you might that that's still needed in reserve, like because there's no guarantee that we're not going to get a drought this year that the silage won't be used this summer as well. Yeah. Um. So I'd be very slow to, to eat into that. Darren, just a little bit on, I suppose, and maybe the horse is bolted on this one, but still it, it, it refocuses the mind because as Aidan said there, I don't think any of us think that the prices that we paid for nitrogen just 12 and 24 months ago is there's very little on the horizon over the next five years to see that those prices will come back because you look at what's happening in the EU energy market, it's been torn up and obviously nitrogen prices are controlled uh, by energy prices, uh, like if we are here in this new environment uh, of, of uh, let's say, north of 600, 600, 700 euros a ton for urea, maybe easing back a little bit, uh, but the importance of getting soil structure right and getting P and K right and, and lime right, do you see a big drive into that this year? Yeah, definitely, Justin. And look, at even we're seeing that already, say the price of lime, the price of lime probably hasn't gone up much, but the uh, they say the co-ops or the, I suppose, uh, manufacturers of lime are, uh, are looking big time at, say, supply challenges, what they have. And they're probably the big thing that's going to affect it, I think, once lime starts moving in any quantity, is fuel price. And that's mm. what they're saying to me, is that the fuel price is going to dictate where the lime goes up. Because they say there isn't a huge, say, driver in demand yet that would bring about a big increase. But... If they have to draw a line a long way, well, then you could see a surcharge of one, two, three euros a ton going on it. Uh, I was talking to Peter Thomas last week just on, say, the contractor charges for us. And he said it's still early days yet, but he said that some of the contractors are talking about that instead of 22, 24 ton last year, you're now looking at maybe 28, 30 ton at least, uh, say, for, for lime applied. But I do think this that's where a lot of farmers should look first. And like my advice, even to some of the lowly stock sheep farmers, there wouldn't be big uses of fertilizer and that are maybe staying out of the market and will now find it hard maybe to get in at a higher price. Is it if they put out a ton of lime where they would have been putting out a bag of fertilizer, they might get as much from it if they haven't a major demand for grass. Now that's not going to do with a high stock on it. But I think that long term if uh, I suppose Aidan made a comment, this is going to be a four or five year thing. I think if farmers can do something, it's to look at side fertility for the next few years, then start to look at clover, start to look at multi species swords, whatever it be, because a lot of them things won't get them out of trouble this year. And this is a three, five year plan. Guys, we have a few questions in there already. And, and Darren, I want to come back to you in the schemes, but we'll, we'll go to the clip that you and Adam uh, produced later on. But I just just before we do, uh, a farmer here, he has 50 bales of, si- of haylage, uh, sorry, left in the yard made in 2020. He doesn't need them, but he opened three or four of them and they were a bit mouldy on the outside. It's not deep, but he's worried that if he leaves them for another year, it might get worse. Uh, what do you think? I can sell them for 20 euros a bale to a neighbour who's tight on silage, and I'm thinking that a bird in the hand might uh, be worth two in the bush. 
if he has nothing at all uh, at all next year if they go too mouldy. I don't know who wants to come in on that one. Justin, I just take it from a sheep point of view. If it was me and the sheep mm. side of things, I'd be moving them on because uh, yeah. just how prone sheep are to listeriosis. But also the fact that he said he's open three or four and they've all had mould. Like I know it mightn't be much, but uh, I have my views is this. They're probably not double wrapped. There was a lot of, I know, say, hay meadows, even some of the traditional hay meadows were bailed at a very high dry matter last year. And some of that silage is going to be hard keep. Mm. That's yeah, what I... was neighbor in the that's what was neighbor in the sheep farmer, Darren. <laughs> Adam, were you wanting to come in there? No, no, I'd, I, I, I'd agree. You know, that the fact that, that there's mold on a few of them, that that's going to grow probably more. It's going to get deeper. I, I think I'd, I'd be letting them off too and, 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 and trying to maybe buy a few, well, buy one ton maybe of fertilizer in, in da- its place. Darren, interesting one here. Is there any value in maize silage for finishing lambs? The local tillage farmer is sown on contract for dairy farmers and has some spare acres. I use quite a bit of meal to finish lambs indoors. Could I replace it with maize? Yeah, just that's quite a common question. Uh, a lot of really? questions coming in on graze and fodder beef as well. And where it's coming from at the moment is fellas that are handling a lot of store lambs because it's been quite lucrative for the last two years, three years mm. actually even. And But they're using huge quantities of concentrates. They're okay for this year because they're bought in. The research in Chagas and Atenai, we actually have a questions and answers on the page this week. So that's why I'm familiar with it. Uh not say not you won't get the same gains as what you would with finished beef cattle or say dairy cows. There isn't the same uh, benefit in intake or in uh, efficiency of feed usage. So you're looking in the say the research in that I would have been roughly the same as comparable to good quality silage. Now when I talk about good quality silage, it's they're making it 75 D and D plus in that trial. So if you could get right good quality silage then the may silage isn't going to be much better unless there's a yield element and you need to bring in feed from outside that you're going to be tight in uh, a farmer here would uh, asking you what your preference is may silage or fodder be for next spring i usually need to feed six to eight kilos of concentrates for a month to six weeks in february and march i'm wondering if that might be a better bet Six to eight kilos is a lot of meal, you know, and mm. I, I mean, uh, so I suppose the advantage of, of maize or beet is that it's higher energy, so, but it's lower protein, so you need to balance that as well. You, if you're, if, if you might get away with less meal, but you'd need to feed a higher protein meal to balance with the the, the, pro, the, the low protein in, in the in the maize or the beet. I suppose my preference would probably be beet. Um, number one, you can buy it by the load in, in next spring. Uh, you don't need to store it uh, as such for, for long periods. Um, but it's a you know it's it, it's a feed that needs work. You need to chop it and needs to be cleaned. Uh, you need to build cows up in it slowly. It's not simple, you know. Mm. And neither, neither is maize. Um, I yeah. think that's important. That's a very important point, Aidan, because you think of that farmer. He's probably calving in the middle of calving at that time as well. So starting out a whole new layer of work into the farm business, beef can be a dirty thing to have around the yard. It can be a difficult thing, as you say, feeding it as well, take a lot more time. You, you just want to be careful. You're not saving, again, coming back to saving a penny to lose a pound and, mm. and have problems down the line and, and, and creating more pressure on the farm. Yeah, and in some situations, I can't say it's this, you know, but it's, some people then maybe they get away with less concentrate and maybe like cows might still perform as well, you know, so... Yeah. There's, there's, you know, you'd wonder is eight kilos a meal necessary? Look, depends on the yield that the cows are doing and all the rest. I can't comment on that. Oh, yeah. just, just by this. But you know, it's um, it is a lot of concentrate. I'd say maybe you could look at reducing that anyway. Um, and then, yeah, you need to be set up for the beet and the maize, to be honest. And if that farmer is set up for it, then it's probably it's probably a reasonable option to reduce his exposure to concentrate. Just jumping back a little bit, guys, and then we'll go to our video. But like the likes of we can we can complicate this. We can start talking about maize. We can start talking about beet and things that that farms aren't set up to feed. But I sometimes think it's one that's often overlooked because it's quite boring. Roll barley or oats. Uh, we don't necessarily need, need to go to a tillage farmer and ask them to to plant beet for us or to plant oats for us. Maybe setting ourselves up and, spe- and, and, and setting ourselves up to be able to take or, and treat some barley or some oats off the combine uh, and uh, directly off a tillage farmer or, or work with a tillage farmer to treat it for you and store it and you can take it then as you need it over the winter. Surely, Adam, that has to have a lot of potential for guys uh, finishing rations. You go to Grange and you see them finishing cattle on 90% rolled barley and, and a bit of soya. Like sometimes we make this very complicated. Maybe the cost savings can actually be delivered by making it simpler. 
Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, look, last back in, Justin, you could have bought in that road barley, probably a 200, maybe, or 220 a ton um, in terms of into a yard. But I suppose maybe a lot of beef farmers are maybe set up for storing that. But you're right, if it's if it's prop corn or whatever, it can, it'll can it last for a very long time um, stored in a heap, you know, in a yard. And, and there's contractors actually come in and do that now during the year as you need it. Even if you take a step back from that, again, quality silage, um, you know, on, on, especially on dry stock farms, we're really, really poor at making quality silage on dry stock farms. Um, and we rely on concentrates, concentrates heading north to 400 euros a tonne for next winter. So it's 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 a no brainer to try and cut an early crop of silage this year and try and make quality silage and get that into Weanlands. Um, because think about it, there isn't going to be surplus bales if we're spreading less fertilizer. So sometimes those good bales of paddocks goes into to Weanlands for the winter. We're not going to have those good bales because we're probably not going to have surplus grass for the summer. So it's 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 really important that a good quad. And Adam, quad just on that, and I heard Sean saying it there in the in the in the in the video clip there earlier. The are you grazing off the silage ground first of all? Like is that the first step to making good quality silage? Sean was talking about there being good growth over the winter. You'd really want to get that growth off. We're getting a relatively good dry spell, albeit starting to maybe break a little bit tonight. Yeah. Uh, to get in and get the silage ground grazed off. Is, is that your advice? And then come in with your slurry and whatnot. Yeah, I don't know whether we're lucky or unlucky on Tullamore Farm that we've loads of them little white things and, and they come in during the winter time and they eat off that silage ground during the winter. So uh, that silage ground at the moment is very, very bare because the, the O's only came off it there just before Christmas when they were coming into the house. So so it's it's like a golf but golf course, not that I know a lot about golf courses, but it's very short grasses on it at the moment. Um, and that'll make quality silage in terms of we don't have to go in there again and graze it. And Sean will get an early cut of silage that uh, that again, in terms of it's 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 on the wetter type of the farm as well. So so it doesn't lend itself to that early grazing. Very, but, it, but it would be important where you didn't have those sheep to go in and graze off. That's the first step. You're right. That's the first step to graze it off. must be those little white things down that are paying for the fertilizer there for the buffalo <laughs> cows, is it? Is that what he's referring to? I'll <laughs> definitely... Definitely, Justin. It's uh, it's going a long way towards it anyway. <laughs> but we we won't charge we, yeah. we won't charge because it's it's uh, the sucker cows that are eating all the silage. Before the low blows go in, ladies and gentlemen, I think it's a, a perfect opportunity now to uh, to uh, scoot back down to Tullamore Farm uh, where Darren and Adam caught up earlier uh, to talk about the schemes and what farmers should be looking at in 2022. Okay, Darren, I suppose there's an awful lot of talk at the moment out there around multi-species swords and, and what, what changes can occur on farms this year in, re, in relation to reducing fertiliser applications and trying to reduce maybe that fertiliser bill on farms. In terms of if we look at Tullamore Farm, and look, we had a plan maybe maybe six, 12 months ago about sort of moving more towards environmentally friendly practices. Not that we're environmentally friendly already, but more environmentally friendly practices on the farm. But what realistically can a farm like Tullamore Farm do in 2022 to try and reduce their exposure to, to very high fertiliser prices. It can't happen overnight, sure it can't. It, no. it, it has to be over a longer period. And I think you hit the nail on the head when you said that we were looking at this six months ago. This, it's not as if farmers are going to wake up and see this scheme and see multi-species swords as the saver. Uh, because there's a lot of things that need to be taken into account, particularly with multi-species swords. One of them is that it nearly needs to be farmed as a farmlet on its own. We've seen from research that there's no doubt that there is potential with regards to animal performance, there's potential reducing the volume of nitrogen you put in. Longer term, there's question marks around the uh, persistency around all of them crops, and that's something we look to say, trying to get on board here and teasing it out. But for me, and I think this is what we looked at in Tullamore Farm, is that we come in, sow an area, and that'll be farmed as a farm. Yes. That coming in and sow on one acre, Adam, yeah. in, in isolation, yes. is going to do So nothing. what you're saying is, I suppose, if Sean's grazing on a block of six paddocks, you're saying if he puts in multi-species in the six paddock, that won't work into that rotation that well in terms of grazing around those stock. No, because it'll take a long time for the rumen to adjust to the microbes, say there's different microbes that'll break down in plants, uh, and, and when it does, it's like rocket fuel in this, if you're grazing chicory, plantain, clovers. But like, for me, farmers should take a step back and like, there's an awful lot of positivity around chicory, plantain, a, a whole 
forecast them but there's a lot that can be done with clover as well and maybe that can be a fit for some farmers is establishing white clover even red clover for silage but to me it needs to be an overall system because the other thing you need to look at this year is we're going to expect our swords to do every one of them to do a little bit more with less, less nitrogen so if we come into Tullamore farm and we take just say 15% of the ground or 20% out to go and go aggressive on multi-species swords. Yes, we'll set them up and we'll have them coming on stream later on the year, but we're going to leave the other 85% of the ground very, very, I suppose, maybe exposed and under pressure in a year where we're trying to maybe spread a little less fertilizer on them swords. So I think people need to look at the demand profile. They need to look at aspects like, have you, how much forage you've left over from last year? Because it could be a case that this might be a year for some people that are very well situated with a good uh, clamp or silage left or maybe bales left over and it won't be under as much pressure to go out and to say, apply or to put in some multi-species over saw some clover but it's not going to be an overnight solution and it's going to be one that farmers need to look at as a sort of as a an overall or holistic farming system that can combine together there is costs associated with the establishment of these swords and there is a scheme there a multi-species sword scheme but you're, what you're saying is it shouldn't be a knee-jerk reaction just to say there's a scheme there folks we need to go for it we need to get all the money we can out of that scheme it needs to be a bigger decision than that Bigger decision than that, Adam, need to even look at, say, take a step back and look at the, the soil fertility because it's not all soils that this is going to go in at. You're going to need soils at optimum P, optimum K for establishment. You're going to need soils at the right pH. Uh, and if you don't have that, no different than coming in and reseeding is you're putting good money after bad in this. For me, it's take a step back, look at your soil fertility. like. We're talking about maybe a bag a year that we have sitting in the yard at over 50 euros a bag. 20 euros and a ton of lime, or it'll be up closer to 27, 28, or even maybe 30, depending on the price of fuel. But it's still cheaper than Yes, but that might be double the value of that bag of fertilizer at 50 euros. Yes. And that's something that farmers need to, I suppose, is, is not to panic, but at the same time, there needs to be urgency around what you need to go what you need to, uh, I suppose, the demand you need to meet, and then look at, well, this is what I need to do to get over the next six months, because the next six months is the most critical, and also what can I need to do to set my farm up for the next 12, 24 months, because there's nothing to say that this isn't going, we're not going to be standing here on Tullamore Farm next year and fertiliser at sky high prices. Uh, it'll take a long time to adjust. You mentioned soil fertility, Darren, and we have the National Soil Sampling Programme scheme, we'll say, and the soil samples have been taken. Where, where are we at on that in terms of progress? Well, some, some farmers ringing me saying, we don't have results here yet, what can we do? But really, in terms of correcting soil fertility this year, it may not be the year to do that in terms of really going hard on anyway, correcting soil fertility in 2022, given where fertiliser prices are at. This should be a longer term picture as well. Yes, mightn't be the year for correcting P and K. But, but you will correct part P and K by your lime application and bringing up your pH. So if your pH is down at 5.5, 5.8, by putting on lime, you're going to correct through lime. But it might not be the year, as you say, to go out and to, to go buy in a lot of compounds. Now, the caveat to that, Adam, is that if you take soil samples and you find it on silage ground that you're very low on P and K, well, then I would be saying that you have to target that either with slurry or you have to come in and target that with a compound fertilizer, that it isn't enough to totally come back. Like we're, we're talking about maybe saving on nitrogen, but it's, it's to have that information to hand. And unfortunately, that national soil sampling program didn't get the start it wanted. It's a totally new program. Uh, and, and look, at, I'd be slow to totally dismiss it because there will be good information out of it and hopefully the department will have learned as of what's needed now to be able to put in place exactly what's needed in the back end of the year to get it up and running quick and to, to maybe utilise more samples. I suppose farmers are all talking about war, we're talking about fertiliser prices, we're talking about feed prices, but farming keeps going and, and we'll say the year is moving on. In relation to schemes, there are a number of schemes out there at the moment, just to tell our listeners tonight or our viewers tonight, what's important at the moment in terms of getting getting in there? Oh, sure. Critical Adam, look, we're looking at an April closing date for beep uh, and for the dairy uh, calf welfare scheme programme. You're looking at the, the 15th or it's the 16th to 17th this year, it's the Monday closes on. We're looking at for BPS and that's and that's hugely critical because everything revolves around we've seen it on a 
on dry stock farms in particular, look, dairy are less exposed. But it's to try and get that up and running. On the tillage side, you'll have protein aid scheme, strong corporation measures, a lot of talk around whether farmers will put uh, land into that. It has to be weighed up. Uh, look, at, I suppose there's going to be some more being sown in parts of the area because it will lower the exposure to nitrogen. Strong corporation, I think farmers will put in a lot of land and whether or not they might actually follow through and chop it will depend on what the price of a bale of straw is uh, in the back end of the year and what the overhang is, what weather is like in the next few months because we are coming off the back of relatively good supplies last year. If weather continues to, I suppose, improve in the next few weeks, there might be an overhang in the system, which will help help the thing. And then, I suppose, look at the, the smaller things, Adam, say, around schemes, around compliance, like with the BDGP, uh, getting paperwork right and that paperwork right around the sheep. Well, remember scheme, the, ANC, all of the ANC stocking rate as well, I guess. We're coming up to the end of March. If that's seven months, isn't it, in terms of... So, so you need to be getting stock in fairly soon if you were going to meet that up until the end of October. Yeah, and, and a really important one this year, Adam, is that we're, we're looking at, I suppose, these schemes, but in the background to all of that, there's a new CAP programme coming into play. We have to plan as is, unless something changes radically. A lot of talk around whether it'll be shoved back for another year. Nobody knows yet, Adam, and I don't think that decision is it'll, it'll be late in the year before it's made. But there's a couple of things around eco-schemes and around changes in stocking rates. In this. There's a few, if farmers need to be familiar, there's a few changes to stocking rates at the moment. Your suckler cow used to be one livestock unit. It's 0 0.8 for the purposes of 23 onwards for ANC or for the extensive livestock production thing. And that's going to be based on 2022 levels. Uh, dairy cow is one livestock unit per hectare. Sheep is uh, 0 0.1 of a livestock unit per hectare. Uh, and the minimum stocking rate is going to be 0.1 of a livestock unit. So it's going to be drawn back from that 0.15. And then we've all, I suppose, in the background around active farmers, Farmers will get letters out that are at risk of not meeting that next year, but we, they do have time to plan for that for next year. So but it's, it's important just, to sit down with your advisor this year in terms of planning all that out. It's important to look at what you're doing and to also gear up your farm to be in a position to avail of all of these schemes going forward. Whether that be multi-species, uh, swords, whether it be looking at eco-schemes, whether it be whatever your system can do, it's important now to start. And also then, is the whole thing around entitlements. But look, we could talk for an hour on that. I, the one thing I'd say about entitlements is big changes coming down along the track. From There's going to be an amnesty in 2023 and 2024 that farmers can sell entitlements without any clawback. And as the current position where farmers could draw down their BPS without being an active farmer is going to change. So farmers need to look carefully at what's happening. It's only going to be 12 months down along the way. Thanks, Tom. Thanks for that, guys. That was a, an action, an action-packed slot, Darren. And as you say, I know you've been running the special series in the paper over the last uh, few weeks, but we could hold a webinar, and maybe we will, on on the uh, on the direction of CAP and whatnot. And I'm just reading some of the report there in the paper tomorrow uh, in relation to a lot of farmer frustration, particularly in Carlo. Uh, uh, was it in Tuesday night? Or was it last night? The meeting was in Carlo. A lot of farmers very frustrated, and obviously very serious questions being asked in the future direction of CAP, given. Uh, that it was designed before we're seeing such radical changes to global food security and and indeed uh, the energy policy in Europe as well. But to say that's one we can go back to. One of the things, guys, I want to just pick up uh, with you on is the whole multi-species swords. And uh, Darren, I just want you to tease out a little bit for me, for my own ignorance, uh, to be perfectly honest with you, what you were saying there around how do you incorporate multi-species swords. Are you saying to me, that the last thing you want is to be moving cattle or sheep onto a multi-species sward, then onto a ryegrass sward, then back onto a multi-species sward, that they need to be kept on it when they actually go onto it. Yeah, just in a, I suppose to get the full benefit of it, that's what needs to happen. Now, it depends on how much ryegrass is in your sward, because if you have a multi-species sward where there's quite a high percentage of ryegrass, well, then your adjustment phase won't be as big. But it's no different, I suppose, than going, and in particular on the dairy side, managing that transition from say grass to a grass and white clover sward takes a bit of management and then if you think if you put in herbs on top of that put in chicory plantain if you're going over and back on uh, say going into grass to say for two days then going into multi-species swards the rumen is isn't getting a chance to adjust to that uh 
the animal dinosaur to settle diet and to get the maximum performance in New Zealand, where they would have sown, I suppose, a lot of multi species for a lot of the years, is that they might come in and have it on 10 or 15 percent of the farm. And that they would say stock maybe on the sheep side of things in particular, they might have a sick, a sick mob, is what they call. Now, that's essentially any O's with issues and maybe some yearling hobbits or just something that might in a normal year need concentrates or need extra feed. They come in, they divide it up and they have a rotation around that paddock. But they sort of try and stay away from moving different animals onto it. Others say have came in and they've used it for finishing cattle or they've used it for finishing lambs. But it's it's not ideal to just have a small bit of it and Darn, to be in, bringing in it over terms, back into a different rotation. In, in, in simple terms, is this like a, a man like you who I know likes their pints? Would this be like starting on pints in the middle of the evening and going on to chasers then in the evening? It might not end well the next morning. Is, is, is it you're better staying on one or the other? Is that what you're telling us? Well, it might be the adjustment, Justin, from a glass of milk to the pint and then onto, then onto the whiskey as well. So uh, that might be a step too yeah, far. Do you see a big roll out of these multi-species wars on dairy farms uh, this year? Or has there been even if we look back the last couple of years? In, in pockets, Justin, there's pockets of the country that, that, that you know, have, you know, the discussion groups uh, have, you know, some discussion groups have taken it on board. But I don't, to be, to be honest, I don't see a big uptake this year. Um, I'm not just not sure is this the year to go head, headstrong into a massive receding program for the reasons that Darren outlined earlier in terms of we need to grow feed and if you've a reasonably good performing ground as it is you know take that out of production during the peak growing months is going to exacerbate the problem um, so I'm conscious of that uh, look I mean I think there's something in multi-species I'm, 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 I'm for them but the, you know the research on it is hazy like there, you know there's there's very little uh, hard data from Ireland on, on, on how to perform under dairy, dairy based systems it's you know it's a work in progress it's happening and the indications are very positive but I think there's kind of a mysticism surrounding multi-species but we just need to remember that all it is is, is, is grass and, and clover plus herbs you know uh, plantain and chicory but is that uh, the thing guys is, is that is that really it in a nutshell are we not nearly better to stick with the proven of of the clovers uh and and would you be saying to a guy that this might be the year to go and broadcast some clover seed into an open sward or, or to look at some of the rejuvenation techniques oh yeah definitely i mean that's an ongoing thing you know you have to be you know if you're getting clover established is now a no-brainer like because just with all where we are in terms of you know the world and, and, and for Clyde's supply that we agreed, you know, it's, it's going to be restricted for the next number of years. Um, the sooner we get more clover into farms, the better. It's a no-brainer. Um, the question is, do we see a benefit of going in with the herbs as well? There probably is. They don't last too long, though, is the only issue. And do we need to manage it differently? And does that man different management then upset the overall farm and cause other problems? Um, so, like, you know, they're, they're an issue. Like, okay you want to have ideally you'd have 20 30 percent of your farm in multi-species if we're doing it but like you can't do that overnight so there is going to be a transition progress into it uh transition phase yeah look i i would much rather see the department incur you know put money and it's 50 euro a bag for anyone wondering that's you know 50 euro an acre uh is is what they're is what the department are, are giving and rebate on per, per bag of multi-species seed um i'd much rather see that go is this seed available Aiden, by the way is there <laughs> Like it's well, not going to uh, what what's availability like both of, of multi species seeds and, and clover? So all seeds are going to be scarce this year. Uh, clover in particular. Um, I'm here and I heard even today that there's an awful lot of clover being imported from uh Eastern Europe, uh, just because it's not available in Ireland or the UK. Uh, and the issue with all that, you know, seeds that coming in that are based maybe in those kind of continental climates, climate, that they're yeah. they're they're used, they're they're bred to, to withstand very cold winters and very warm summers, not a temperate climate we have here. So be very, very careful. Even some of the crops are you know reputable companies are selling these seeds. Maybe they don't know the full implications of it. Um, but like not all clover seed is the same. It should be on uh the recommended list either in Ireland, England or mm. or, or, or Wales or Northern Ireland. Um or, uh, so like it's you know it's very it's 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 important that that you, what you're putting in is is correct. Um but look, red, red and white clover. There's also, the, in fairness to the department, they are they are supporting. I, I don't know the exact details on it, but they're also supporting a red clover uh, scheme, which is I think is important. There's something in that. If you've an out an out farm that you're not going to be grazing and you're using it for for two or three cuts of silage, you know, red clover is a real live option there that you can 
not spread any nitrogen in that, and you still have, have good crops. I mean, that's been shown in Grange studies over a number of years that red clover is produces excellent quality silage but zero nitrogen uh, and and similar yields if not more yields than 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 silage getting uh, a lot of a lot of nitrogen. Adam, in the video, Darren talked about us being quite fortunate because I know it, it was privy to some of the discussions you guys were having in relation to multi-species wards and red clover uh, in uh, on Tullamore Farm. Where are you this year? Are you going for multi-species or what, what's your plan? Because one of your key focuses, as you say, is to reduce that, in, that level of imported concentrate, concentrates onto the farms, particularly for the young bull beef system. Yeah, so, so we're actually going to try both, but really from a farm point of view, it's, it's about the red clover on Tullamore. We've 10 acres earmarked on Cluna, which is pretty dry, uh, good pH um, and good soil P and K index. Um, we're going to go in there with about six kilos of, of red clover and six kilos of grass, uh, tetraploid grass, quite an open grass that, that won't maybe drown out the, the red clover. And we'll go in with some white clover on that as well. I suppose the idea there, if you go in a monoculture red clover, it'll it'll maybe two years as the persistency, whereas if, you, if, if grass goes in there, as well um obviously that'll take over well in time as the red clover dies out it's it's it basically it'll be a silage system on on that 10 acres uh, we'll cut it three or four times and um, we'll go out with slurry um we'll say after each cut um, and you're probably going to take five or six bales to the acre after each of those cuts um and the aim is to 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 to, to produce real high quality silage high protein content silage to go into those bulls and as you said reduce the concentrate input into those bulls you're going so to that, bale that adam you're not going to yeah that. you're going to keep it separate no it'll be bale because it'll be only 10 acres and i guess there'll be a there'll be a light cut of silage taken three or four times um off that um it's 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 a plow job i guess maybe you can oversow white clover but uh, my understanding is that red clover won't take that well in in it w- w- over so and so it's 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 a plow and till job and it's it's a quite a fine seed embedded and it's it's quite a shallow um in terms of seed depth as well i think it's around about one centimeter in terms of that seed it's very important that it's not buried maybe too low and look at it's a different management proposition for sean down there and look at it's another complication to the system but i think there is something in it aiden's right there definitely is something in it and we're, we're willing to try it out down there as regards the multi-species it's more of an open day thing. Maybe we'd really love maybe to try just a patch of that, just basically to show farmers down there in the open day on the 26th of July, this is a multi-species sword. This is what it looks like. And this is maybe how we'll manage it. Uh, but as Darren said, it's going to be harder on a smaller area. We, Sean, Sean's very <laughs> apprehensive about all this because I guess what Aidan has just said, we're lifting our stocking rate in our grazing ground when we're taking out that 10 acres. He wants to maximise the first cut of silage down there. He has 60 acres closed up a little bit more than last year. So that's that, that 10 acres is going to put even more pressure on the grazing ground and look we don't want to be going out we've a sort of a, a target down there to be reducing our, our, our nitrogen fertilizer by, by 15 percent over a couple of years that could be a little bit more accelerated than we thought we thought five years but obviously prices will will dictate maybe trying to pull that back a bit quicker and adam in uh or, sorry darren do, do you envisage getting those white things that uh, as adam refers to them as uh, a grazing on the red clover can you can you go in in the autumn and graze that could you yeah, we can just as long as it's not six weeks pre-breeding or six weeks post-breeding due to the high levels of oestrogens, that just interferes with the fertility. But look, it's a great feed for, say, finishing lambs on. It does take that bit of more management with regards to bloat. But uh, no, it is, it is, look, at the, it, it does have a lot of potential. The only thing to, to be, sorry, yeah. Justin, the only, like, yeah, grazing red clover is very dangerous. Like, so in terms of if you graze it too low, you'll kill it. So mm. it's not a, it's not very, it's it doesn't work great in the grazing situation. Um, so you, some you people. Do, you, you do realise now, Darren, if you let the sheep onto it and it doesn't work, Adam will blame you uh, for the sheep for, <laughs> for overgrazing it. That, uh, yeah. Aidan has just given Adam a, a get out of jail card there. So <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, Darren, I just, I, actually guys, before we go with that, and, and again, I just want to hammer home some key points from, from tonight. What I'm hearing here loud and clear is we can talk about multi-species swords, we can talk about clover, we can talk about maize and sugar beet and fodder beet and all these things. But actually, is it time to go, is the first step the very basics? And it's, it's, not, the, it's not a costly test. Or Is it go out and get the soil pH done and test your soil pH and get your lime, and get, get your lime on and get your pH right? And you could get a bigger boost than anything because if you're going to put in clover, if you're going to put in red clover, white clover, or if you're going to be putting on uh, nitrogen, the way to maximize all of that is having the pH right. 
Absolutely. There's, there's 80% of, of dry stock farms not optimum for PHP or K. Going in there with a multi species sword or a red clover sword could be the, the last thing you'd need to do because it'll be an absolute disaster. Correcting, as Darren said, correcting pH, you'll probably get a kick out of soil nitrogen that, that's there. You'll, you'll probably you'll get a wee kick out of grass growth as a result of that, and you'll be improving the thing further. Correcting P and K, I'm not too, even sure is, is, is this a year for correcting P and K issues on farms. Said that to Darren um, because the price of that in terms of trying to correct it, correct it with slurry, but, but definitely not purchasing P and K care this year Darren uh, just on the closing dates of the various schemes just give us a rundown through them what's happening uh, what the farmers need to do like what's the key actions now over the next two months say, in terms of all the schemes and the closing dates and the application for them well even just in the next two weeks so two weeks. next Monday is say the closing date for the multi-species swords uh, the Tiddy scheme is going to work off your BPS so if you have say ground that's in this grassland this year if it goes in as tillage it'll be collected or it'll be found it'll be say department will know that way on BPS so that's the way they're going to work that we don't know the full details of that schemes yet uh, the BPS scheme is the 25th of April there's a uh, Tams tranche closing the 8th of April uh, another tranche open the 9th of April and then after that, we're back into our normal ones, the 16th of May for your BPS transfer of entitlements has to be done by then areas of natural constraint. Uh, so they are your main ones, Justin, for young farmers, they have to have them applications in. Uh, and then Aidan, I don't know that he wants to have a mention because there's a couple of changes on the nitrate side of things mm. that the normal closing date is, is say changed on that. And there's probably a couple of things farmers need to be aware of there. Just, do you want to pick that up, Aidan? I think, uh, Darren, it's the 16th of April, I think, is a closing date for memory. Am yeah. I right in saying that? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Okay, guys, with uh, another run of questions, and remember, guys, we want your interaction. Uh, WhatsApp us 0868366465 or email us on webinar at farmersjournal.ie. Adam, you mentioned spreading fertilizer for silage this weekend. Is that not a bit earlier, or are you targeting a cut of silage in mid May? I'm just saying with weather, we, we've seen it in the northwest before, uh, Justin, where, where, where we haven't used the opportunity of dry weather. And next thing, the weather will break and it'll be three weeks, maybe broken weather. And we'll not get back out with fertilizer until the end of April. And then you're into June of a cut. Just use this opportunity. Use the dry weather. The ground is dry. Conditions are brilliant. Just use it now and, and try and get in there. Yeah, sure. But what's what's wrong with on, uh, getting in at the end there's of no, April? There's no fear. I, I, I suppose there's a fear if it comes wet, Adam, it will get washed away. And the last thing, uh, even from an environmental point of view, but from an economic point of view this year, you don't want that to happen. No, but we haven't we haven't huge rain forecasts, I suppose, for the next few days. Okay. I still think I still think we should be going out there. Definitely, it's given pretty dry weather till next Monday or Tuesday. So I, yeah, I definitely get out there this weekend. Darren, if I maximise all the schemes, how much money can I get? <laughs> how long is a piece of string, Justin? Uh, <laughs> I suppose uh, for a typical I... maybe maybe Darren for to, if we divide it into categories here for a typical beef or sorry li livestock farmer, dairy beef, whatever. What is the scheme most applicable to them at the minute? The new scheme, and maybe for a tillage farmer, what's the scheme most applicable? If we the, 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 the ANC for my lads, sorry, the ANC for my lads, that's that's the most important of all. Um, for that's, for, the minimum, for, for, that's the minimum stocking rate, yeah, for, for the northwest. And you, you, you spoke of a few changes in the video there on that, Darren, did you? In terms of, yeah, there's a couple of changes in stocking rate that's coming in for say next year, so it's just important to be mindful of that, say that the uh, and active farmer clause now. Farmers will get a bit of, uh, say, documentation out about that through, through the year. So they will be able to get, say, advanced. But if we're looking at, say, new schemes, look at the multi-species swords, you're not going to make money out of it. The 50 euros goes to the co-op to supplement the price of buying the bag. We don't know yet, Justin, how much that bag is going to be. That would have been anywhere from 60 to 70 to 80 euros, depending on the mix last year. Just talk of seed uh, being more expensive. On the new Tilly scheme, 400 euros a hectare uh, for ground that is put back, uh, I, I suppose converted isn't just the right word because they're set aside also in the mix, but say from ground that's going from grassland into a tillage crop. So that's just 400 euros there. The 300 euros is guaranteed for 14 aid crops. So that's your beans, peas, lupins, red clover. And then there's 150 euros for combi crops. Now, that's a mix of a cereal and a protein crop. Uh, what level of uptake will be on those? 
will probably depend on either farmers joining up with a tillage farmer because there needs to be a bit of expertise talking dandy on this is if you're plowing down grassland management of a tillage crop on that in year one will be quite tricky and for me this is probably one of the times where we need to start to harness the relationship between tillage farmers and every other farmer now that we've seen in the past we go to a tillage farmer when something like this happens and we don't need them again until five years down on the line and if we could develop say relationships where they'd even sow these crops we can improve our cell sufficiency and nutrients go on the other way because i think look, that's a question that will be will be have to come out of this as well is that are we ever going to get back to the same reliance on imported feed and I, I think you hit the nail on the head Darren. this isn't going to be short term uh we need to be developing strategies we need to be develop, developing protocols for sectors to work together to to, to maximize uh the benefit guys i have a few more questions here uh but i'm going to pause them because uh where the next the next slot is we're going to look at uh talking about advice for silage fertilizer and the importance of getting good silage stocks in before we do we're going to take a short commercial break hello my name is kieran lenehan and i work with chanel as a technical specialist I'm delighted to say that we've just launched a new anticoxidial product to add to our range. It's the Diclazeril and it's called Dicoxin. It's licensed for the prevention of coccidiosis in lambs and calves. So at Chanel we give the people what they want and there was a huge demand for Diclazeril out there. I think every farmer has experienced coccidiosis on their farm at some point, myself included. It's a disease that seems to get more and more prevalent and topical with every passing spring. So coccidiosis is also quite a tricky disease to get your head around and this year at Chanel we've put a big effort into creating awareness about the disease and about how you can avoid and prevent it on your own farm. Adam, is that that fellow who used to work for us? That's him, that's the famous yeah. Kieran. yeah. We, we yeah. trained them well, we trained them well, <laughs> thanks, to, thanks to Kieran and, and Chanel. Uh, animal health their support and of course acts of farm insurance okay guys before we continue on the debate we're going to skip back down to Tullamore farm uh, where Darren and Adam talk all things silage Okay, Darren, I suppose looking out there and speaking to farmers every day as we do, there's a lot of farmers, a lot of dry stock farmers in particular, that are sort of sitting back maybe and not purchasing fertiliser. That's not the right thing to do. There's no simple way of saying that. No, and you can see where the indecision has come from, Adam. Like, I suppose if you look at, say, dry stock and farmers in general, a lot of sheep farmers, a lot of suckler farmers, particularly in the rest of Ireland, they've probably only been buying now anyway. This, on a normal year, they mightn't have been buying too much earlier. And so we seen a panic last week when there was increase in prices talked about. Some farmers just held back altogether. Some went in and bought less than what they need or bought a percentage of what they need. Look, at it, it, no one knows what was the right thing to do, but I think you need to have some sort of a plan in your head on if you don't have fertiliser, what, what are you going to do? And it's very hard to turn off that tap when it's on. The big requirement here, I guess, is silage for next winter, isn't it? In terms of, uh, you know, having that budget made, you know, sitting down, seeing how many cows you're going to have next winter. Is it 20 cows? Is it 30 cows? Multiplying that out by the tonnes they require a month and seeing how much you ground you need to close up now for silage. Because people, the temptation would be there maybe to eat into silage ground now and maybe not close up as much silage ground because I guess that problem is far away. It's really this time next year, it's spring 2023, where that could hit us. But it's really, really critical that farmers out there spread enough fertiliser on silage ground, close up enough silage ground to make sure we get enough silage for next winter because God knows ration prices could be through the roof next winter. We don't know, I guess. There's a lot of unknowns there. Yeah, th there's a double in that, Adam. So one is quantity and the other one is quality. So I think that you really have to look at the two of them this year. This, there, there is also a few farmers that said to me, I shall put out less fertiliser and I let it bulk up. But having a bulk of a poor quality crop is probably leaving you in a worse position off if you are skimping through very good quality silage because you could you could draw it out a bit longer or you're less yeah. exposed maybe to concentrates and i think as you said like this if, if you see how much you have left over i think that, that we're in a fortunate position that some farmers are going to have that left over then as you say see what you need and then try and work out well 
can I reduce back fertilizer a bit? Because there will be some farmers that maybe in the past that maybe spread more fertilizer than what the type of sward they had was able to utilize. And sure, you see that here on Tullamore Farm, like, like you're probably going on the newly reseeded swords with a higher allocation and maybe all the swords, maybe with less, like, or, or what exactly are you working on? Yeah, well, that, that's it, Darren. I suppose here on Tullamore, we'd have been spreading to making sure we have enough grass, and we'd have been taking out paddocks as we go, so we were probably growing in excess of grass. But that you have to be mindful of that as well, in terms of we would have counted on some of those bales then to make up some part of our, our winter fodder. So this year, if we're pulling back our nitrogen applications a little bit on our grazing ground, the likelihood is we won't have that surplus bales to come out, so the likelihood is we'll need more silage in the pit to get through next winter. We have some silage left in the pit, and hopefully... We, We'll, we'll have some silage left, uh, we'll say, as we get to, we'll say, full turnout. Um, but we're really conscious here on Tullamore Farm in terms of making enough silage for next winter. We do not want to be in a position where we're out there paying over 400 euros a ton for concentrates and trying to, because I don't think there'll be silage to buy next next winter. A lot of those lower stock people, maybe that would, we would have bought silage in the past here from local people who would would have made surplus silage low, very very lower stock farms. They, in, in all likelihood, won't spread a lot of fertilizer this year, and they won't be bailing that surplus silage. So that silage won't be there. Uh, to be purchased. On a normal year you probably would have went would you with 100 units of nitrogen will you go bring it timing back to 80 or where yeah, you Yeah maybe uh, you, you might say maybe back about 15% we sort of talked about pulling back we sort of talked about over the next five years that we'd love to be in in five years time we'd love to have nitrogen applications down by 15% that could come an awful lot quicker maybe than, than we would like given that where our purchases are because really in terms of purchases and in terms of input costs for the farm this year it's it's absolutely huge we would have spent about 18 19,000 on fertilizer in 2021 that bill is, is going to be closer to 42 43,000 for 2022 um, and that's a huge we'll say cash flow problem for the farm it's a huge cash flow problem I'm taking calls from farmers every day too in terms of that they would have went out today bought fertilizer on credit from a merchant um, and waited to sell cattle during the year and they're saying what, what am I going to do here in terms of the merchant is looking for money and rightly so I guess the merchant has bought in that fertilizer dear, dear price they don't want to be highly exposed to that money we'll say over the next six months or whatever so they're looking for the money and look what I've been saying what we don't want to see I suppose is wholesale selling a cattle early and selling cattle under finished but definitely if there's if there's unproductive cattle on the farm like maybe cows that didn't go in calf um, maybe cows that lost a calf now is the time probably to, and they're a serious price in the, at the moment in March and really probably they should be liquidated and use that to, to buy some fertiliser in the next couple of weeks Likewise the few barren yours Sean had here we were able to sell them and I think they was 138, 140 yours and look there'll be a lot of cool yours on farms after lambing this spring and I think that that's something that the unproductive stock should be moved on and and as you say it's about sort of trying to generate that cash flow there'll be some farmers that look at your hoggets and like for the next eight weeks we're going to have a very very good uh, say your hogger trade uh, or say a hogger trade in general so your hoggets are that going to make the mark for the back end of the year there's an option there of liquidating those like you'd have to say Adam this I know on Tullamore farm here you have a lot of cattle going through the system through the bull system anyway but there has to be an option on some farmers that it's very hard to see that the beef trade wouldn't be good for at least the next two three months this should a farmer sit down and weigh up his options uh, is he better off maybe taking a pin of cattle, bringing him through to finish? Yes, it'll be costly at the moment, but he should get it back in beef price. And that could be his way of insulating himself on the fertiliser prices. Yeah, absolutely. I suppose there's a little bit of unknown towards the end of the year as regards where numbers will go. But at the moment, we're up 29,000 on kill numbers. You know, beef supplies are very tight. Cattle finish, cattle supplies are very tight. And beef cattle are a very good trade in terms of in, in marts and in factories. And yeah, you're right in terms of maybe if you had forward store cattle that were fairly close to finish as opposed to going to grass, I'd be keeping them in the shed maybe. In terms of, a lot of those maybe some farmers have locked into prices too for ration. They aren't going to that 400, 450 a tonne that we're maybe hearing about. So they're able to buy it a lot cheaper. So that could be definitely a strategic decision to maybe finish some cattle out of the shed um, as opposed to maybe going back to grass and maybe eating into your silage ground or, or lifting your stocking rate of grass. This could be a year maybe to keep your stocking a little bit lower of grass. None of us are experts on the financial side of things or giving financial advice, but I think to talk to financial institutions as well like 
getting your an overdraft is probably a very expensive option of buying fertilizer. Whereas look what we see cultivate or what farmers know as the credit unions, we see the banks coming out and saying that they're going to support farmers. And look at now is the time for them to really step up to the mark and actually deliver to farmers with 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 loans that, that are affordable. Yeah, we have a poor history, I suppose, on the dry side of the house of looking for credit. We tend to try and do things out of, out of cash flow and that puts huge pressure then on things, we'll say, during the year in terms of paying other bills. So definitely sit down. It, it doesn't, it, you don't need to be Einstein to just, we'll say, list out what all the income is for the year and list out what all the expenditure is for the year and see where the crunch points are. And yeah, it, it might be a year just to go for that little bit of a loan in terms of making sure, again, I'll come back to that silage fertiliser, making sure that you have enough silage in the yard. What we, the last thing we want to see is a farmer with no options I guess next back end. If we have a lot of farmers tight for fodder, maybe an appetite not out there to buy cattle for the winter time, you don't want farmers then panic selling because they don't have they don't have fodder in the yard. They've no other choice but to sell because that's not going to help the cattle trade. Yeah, uh, a farmer said to me the other day, or I think uh, we were talking about this earlier, that by circumstance he was going to become an organic farmer. Like there's a lot of talk there around farmers that, well I won't spread anything, I see what comes. And look we could have a kind spring but ground is only going to go so far this year and i think it's 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 talking as you said about the schemes talking to your advisor early sitting down putting that plan in place it it, it has to be forward planning has to be the way just finally for farmers watching in tonight i guess we're very close to, to silage fertilizer application we're talking what like 80 100 units of nitrogen i think it's 16 units of p and and up on 100 units of k we'll say for that silage that's what needs to go out on that silage ground and um, there's no point in cutting that fertilizer way back and bringing in a contractor to cut pit silage in the month of june and him running around on a five ton crop or a six ton crop and charging 120 or 150 euros an acre to do that that's a false economy um, so in terms of getting out there with slurry, I know that's a little bit hard on the west, but we're after having a really good dry week of weather there. There should be an opportunity maybe on a lot of silage fields to get out there with slurry and then top top that up with nitrogen. There should, Adam, and, and I think this where you talk about the 100 units going back to 80 units, you can probably afford maybe on the 80 unit man with an old permanent pasture, might be able to go back to 70 or maybe slightly under it. So it's, it's horses for courses and, and knowing what you have and knowing what you can grow. Thanks, Tom. Thanks for that. Uh, Aidan, I'm going to come to you because I know you have an interesting piece from Chagas in the in tomorrow's uh, Farmer's Journal. But all of this talk, fertilizer costs, contractors' costs are going to be higher. What price are we now talking? What is silage going to cost to put in the pit? And I always think because there's no bill comes into the front door, through the front door for silage, it's contractors' fertilizer. Farmers don't actually really put a price on what silage costs. So maybe talk us through what silage would have typically cost to make and what it's going to cost this year. Yeah, Justin, it's up about 30% uh, the cost of silage uh, for this year. But that's based on Chagas analysis. They've looked at the cost of, you know, contractor costs. Um, they, they've looked at the cost, increased cost of fertilizer, transport, diesel, plastic, plastic, and such. So typically, first cut silage, uh, they're saying it's going to be about 200 euros um, a, a ton dry matter, uh, which is about 20 cents a kilogram of dry matter. Uh, that's for first cut. Second cut is about 240. And then we look at bale silage, then they're around about 226 uh, euros a ton. Um, so that's 22.6 cent a kilo per dry matter. Tra Our layman serves in the, about 46. That in, yeah, translate that into brass tax for Adam's guys there in terms of how much is it going to cost per bale uh, 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 in. It's, it's not just Adam, it's, it's, it's myself as well. So that's, that 226 a, a tonne of dry matter is about 46 euros a bale um, in terms of, you know, that's including a land charge. Take away the land charge, it's about 36 euros a bale. Um, but like you really should be adding that land charge because it's, you know, it's real. I mean, that's that's tangible. Like you can, you can you know, whether you're paying rent or, or, you, or you own the land, you can you can, you can can lease it out. So there's opportunity what cost there. What have you a land charge in there of what, about 300 euros an acre, is it? It's, it's 300 an acre. Yeah, correct. Yeah. Now that's these are chocolate figures. Um, on it, you know, so that's it's thirty percent higher, Justin, and that's the that's the key point there. That like you know, this cost is real, um, and it's going to be there, and 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 farmers have to have to have plan for how they're going to manage it, you know. And Aidan, has it changed the dynamics? Is, is silage still the cheapest forage that farmers can make? Uh, grass silage still the cheapest for uh, forage out there? Is there how does it compare with maize, sugar beet, now or, or different options? 
So, so the maize is yeah, on a, for for first cut silage grass is grass silage is still cheaper um than maize, but second cut uh, maize is cheaper. When you combine the two together, uh, it the cost is about the same, so no real difference. Mm. The only thing I'd say about the maize is so that or with grass silage you can get two if not three grazings. Um, yeah, at the end of the year, right. after doing the first to cut the silage, you can't get that with maize. And and you know, depending on the weather when you go harvest, like if you get an early harvest in September, fair enough, uh, you can um, you get you get grass seeds in at that point. But if it shoves into October, you won't get grass seeds in. And even if you do, like you won't be getting to raise them until until this time, probably the following year. So that ground is out of production for a lot longer than just the growing season of maize, which is important to remember as well. So I would say stick with grass tax. Um, you know, if you're used to make silage, you don't make silage, you can make good silage, grass silage, stick with it before you go looking at alternatives, whether that's maize or fodder beet or, or other crops. Guys, I'm going to shoot down through my questions because I've got a lot of questions in. And remember, guys, 0868366465, our email webinar at farmersjournal.ie. Uh, here we go. What level of fertilizer do I need for a beef system for first cut silage at index one for P and index two for K? Who wants to take uh, Adam Darren? Do you want to grab that one? I, I think if, if you're going out with about three thousand gallons of um, if you're going out with about three thousand gallons of slurry to the acre, that's tr it's three bags of uh, pasture sward along with the three thousand gallons of slurry to the acre will 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 bring you up to the to the but it's it's really important that you're using slurry in that situation because if you mm -hmm. have to make that up with with fertilizer, geez, you'd be through the roof in terms of cost. So mm -hmm. so it's in, in terms of low P and K, you have to be going in there to make that up with slurry. Will I get away with nitrogen fertilizer for silage ground this year? Land that will get two thousand, two and a half thousand gallons of slurry, and I'm thinking a bag and a half of urea on permanent pasture. He's probably not far off the mark there, is he? That should be fine, I'd say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I suppose it depends on the soil indexes, but yeah, he's pretty fine. Yeah, yeah. But look, guys, I think I think what you're saying there is very strong. <laughs> If, if your soil indexes have been low, you obviously haven't been that focused on them over the last three or four years. Now is not the year to become uh, an expert in soil indexes and try to correct everything over over the period of, of 10 months. I think that's the advice that you're given, is it? And, and for silage, Justin, it doesn't matter. Like, I mean, you can feed the crop and you still get a good yield, even if your indexes are low. The important thing is to give the crop the, the, crop the nutrients it needs. Soil fertility yeah. can remain low. Yeah, just, just balance it with extra P and K if need be, or extra slurry as, as, or in whatever form it needs to come in. Can I apply lime on silage ground, or will it will have, or will it have implications on silage preservation? I think it's three months. I think you, you, yeah. it's recommended to leave three months of a break there. It can it can affect the the ensilum process in terms of uh, coming in with the silage. So so it probably on silage ground that's better going out maybe in the autumn time. Or would you put that in the stubble, Adam, after you cut the silage? No. Well, yeah, well, if I suppose if it's going to be three months, then again, in terms of coming in for a second cut. But say, say uh, you're only doing a one cut system. Yeah, 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 you, yeah, you, you could, you, yeah, you, yeah. You could but I don't in. know, I mean, it, it, like, if, if it's well grazed now, I can't see how the lime would end up on the, you know, if we're going to get rain between now and, 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 and the first of June, it's a wash off, any lime that's on the scene. Yeah, like, yeah because know, the lime is actually... I, I'm, I'm only throwing it out there. It could be it it. Like to go with it if it's well grazed. <laughs> Um, we need to put on here, guys. Uh, yeah, uh, I'd say, Darren, I'd say Justin, uh, you need a disclaimer coming up in the bottom of the screen there saying yeah. if anyone's silage is harmed, come ring, back. Ring, 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 Aiden, ring, Aiden, ring, Aiden next November. Yeah, when you've, you want, when you've a bit of silage, you have to dump. Number there for him, <laughs> Adam, do you? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I, I take no responsibility for any of them, just anybody that's listening there. Uh, so they can, uh, guys, just another one. Uh, actually, there is an interesting one that always comes up. The, the timing between slurry and fertilizer on silage ground. Should there be a break? So, so, so you're going to you, up you, for silage ground. You've grazed it off. You're covering it then with, uh, with uh, slurry. Should you go out? The, should, how long should you leave it before you go out your fertilizer? I'd say it's a couple of days. Once it's important that the fertilizer doesn't go out before the slurry because the, the the slurry will create a cap maybe over the fertilizer, and you could create anaerobic conditions, and the fertilizer will become you know you lose it or whatever you lose the nitrogen in it. So it's it's slurry first, then fertilizer. But I'd say a couple of days, I'd be I'd be going out. Get out this weekend. Once you get out with your fertilizer this weekend, it's it, it'll be all okay. Do you agree with that this time, Eden? Do you? No yeah, way. sure. This is sure. I agree with him more, more often than I don't like. <laughs> uh, just a, a farmer, and Adam, you touched on it earlier. Will there be adequate supplies of fertilizer, do you think, for albeit for the year, albeit at ridiculous prices? Certainly, I think the, the, the crunch, where, where people see the crunch coming, is probably in that May, uh, May June time, is it? 
Yeah, I, I don't think, to be honest, there was a lot of scaremongering and that there wouldn't be fertilizer. I, I have no, I have, I haven't talked to a dry stock farmer yet, Justin, in, in the West or, or anywhere, in fact, that, that hasn't been able to get anybody that looked for fertilizer uh, has been able to get fertilizer. And, and uh, look, it's, mm. I, I don't know maybe it's, whether it's the same on the dairy side of the house or the same with Darren, but that that's my experience that the, the genuinely had. Maybe, maybe that'll change later on in the year, but at the moment, there definitely isn't supply issues on farms at the moment. And it's interesting, Anne Finnegan has a piece in, in Tomorrow Farmer Journal actually looking and showing that j- imports of fertiliser in January were well up on, on, on last year. Aidan, have you come across any guys struggling to get fertiliser? No, no. Um, no, it's, it's, it seems to be available. Um, and, and, and I've heard as well that if you can buy it in bulk, it's, it's more readily available. You know, there, there is delays and some people, some people are waiting mm. for loads, that, but they don't really need it. They have enough soil fertiliser in the yard. Uh, but bulk is an option if you're under pressure and you can't get it fast enough. Darren, what do you hear? What's happening in protected urea? Just when I think about it, sure, not not a huge amount, Justin. There is some supplies of it there now, but I think in the year that's in it, uh, where say prices are so high, I think that the, the the sort of thinking around protected urea has taken a back seat. Uh, I I don't I don't hear many people buying it just now, and I don't think merchants went to to the I suppose trouble of getting it because they were unsure about shifting it in. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, what is what is the minimum amount of fertilizer you can apply for first cut side iron? I think you said at the end of the of the VT there that you could go 70 units. Would that be yeah you should look at just on a on a old permanent pasture you'd be saying 70 to 80 normally. Like you can come back down to 60 on that and I don't think it'll have a massive implication. The biggest one I think that you're going to be worried about is if you have new swords and feeding them because of the huge demand for nitrogen. Mm-hmm. Just very, in, oh no, I have another one here on silage. Uh, uh, bo- 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 no, uh, oh, sorry, but it's similarly linked. Is there a risk of bloat from grazing swords where there is a lot of clover? Probably won't for Aiden, yes, more so. Time. Yeah. How do you, how do you, how do you mitigate against it in? Uh, it's, it's difficult. The, the day I was told recently, the day you expect bloat is the day you won't get it. The day you don't expect it is the day you'll get it. Mm-hmm. So it's it's not it's not an easy one. Um, if cows are hungry going into a field with lots of lots of clover in it, there's a greater chance of getting bloat. Then it tends typically to happen in the mornings, and um, you know, on kind of a, a damp misty day, lots of lush grass, and you can get bloat on grass only without any yeah. without any clover as well. So. Um, it's it's a tricky one. I'd say monitor um, monitor cows. Give a small break initially, and then give them a bigger break so they they've got some fiber in, into the stomachs before they they, they can gorge themselves. Mm. Darren, one for you here. What are the chances of the cap program being rolled over for another year? There's definitely a uh, debate happening around that now as as things roll on. Yeah, I don't know. Say Justin about it being rolled over, but I can see changes maybe coming, and more so changes to the whole sort of green deal farm to fork. I think that they were probably gone too far down the road in cap. Yes, you could see some changes or some maybe initiatives being delayed, but as to see it roll over, I I just don't know whether that will happen. And and if it does, the decision won't be made until late in the day. I think that the the sort of the thinking at EU level is they need to push it on and because it's rolled over for two years already. But as you say, Darren, there's definitely a, a renewed focus on the strat on the direction of travel for the cap in terms of food security, on which I suppose cap was ultimately built under the under the Treaty of Rome is is now back centre stage. Maybe not in Europe, but global food security is back centre stage and, and certainly receiving a lot more attention than it was. Oh, massive! Like, and if you look at even all of the initiatives in this cap, like around rewetting the ground, extensive livestock mm-hmm. production. Uh, like so many elements to take, I suppose, production to, to, to knock production back or to bring production back. Now, look, it has environmental benefits too, but there's an awful lot of environmental benefits that you can still build into a program while still safeguarding food production. And I think that that's it needs to be reassessed. I think the whole sort of debate around money moving from say the east of the country or to to the west or from say pockets within counties to more marginal areas i don't see a huge reverse in that that if they're going to do something i think it's going to come back in around sort of couple payments or schemes Mm -hmm. again just because of the eastern block of of countries and that whole push to to flatten their payments but you could definitely see schemes coming around or say maybe some of the money being diverted back into 
uh, support and production again. Aidan, one here on the contract grazing arrangements. How are they working out now in terms of obviously guys taking on heifers and, and, uh, and, and, and contract stock are facing much higher grazing costs? Have they been reflected in new contracts? Yeah, early on in the year anyway, just a lot of them were being renegotiated. I'd say there was a lot of there's a surcharge being put onto a lot of them, you know. Um, as I said at the time, like it's only fair, you know, because the, the contract various costs have increased. Um uh, but like I think it should be linked to something or another, whether mm. put, you know, index it to fertilizer costs or meal costs, whatever the, the, the main input is, um, which would be fair then to both parties. But but definitely, I mean at most a lot of dairy farmers I'm speaking to anyway have 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 renegotiated. Adam, before we move on and, and wrap up and look at what's in, in tomorrow's paper, give me your top three tips uh, on making good quality silage. So make sure it's grazed off. Uh, make sure it's grazed off good and tight. Um, with the sheep, Adam. Sheep. With, with, with sheep or light weanlands. Light weanlands do a very good job either if you don't have any of the, the other things. Um, with the adequate fertiliser, P and K, making sure you get a good, good crop of silage and then going in before basically it heads out and, and you know, biting the bullet with, with, with an early cut in terms of making that quality cut of silage. You know, it'll reduce every 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 day basically from it heads out. So you're talking, you know, 20th of May onwards, please God, we'll get the red weather. But with, with the fertiliser on now, the, the, we should be have every chance of cutting it before the end of May. Guys, it's a pet hate of mine, but I'm going to throw it into the mix anyway. Like, getting the grass grown well, wilted well, into the pit well. Like, there are things that can be done. Having the pit clean in advance of the silage coming in, having it well sealed, having, having it well covered, well rolled in. You see some pits of silage and they're thrown onto the pit. The pit's half, it's, it's not clean. There's farmyard manure that was maybe tipped on it in a while. Like... There's simple things that can be done. Everything we grow this year, we have to be able to fully utilize it and 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 and, and treat it treat it well to, to make sure there's as little waste from getting to the field to down the throat of the animal uh, as possible. Aidan, want to jump back to you because there's a few big stories in the, in tomorrow's farmers journal. One of them, not least, uh, the move by Lakeland, I suppose, to effectively introduce a two-tiered milk pricing system. Talk us talk us through, through that. What what uh, what you'll have in the paper tomorrow. Yeah, Justin. So Lakeland have announced Lakeland Co-op have announced that um, from next year on, any new milk, so any milk over and above 2021 levels, we get a four cent per litre penalty during the months of April, May, and June. Um, so it's a just a huge shift. I suppose a huge shift in policy. It's the first time a co-op have implemented something like that. I know Glambia had um, restrictions uh, on price introduced last year for for peak milk, but that's you know to do with the fact that the it, it was a short term, shorter term period. Uh, it was a three year period. This is a, a, f- a five year plan initially for Lakeland. And I suppose we don't have any real line of sight in terms of what they're happening, what's happening with that money or, you know, is extra processing capacity going to be constructed? So, yeah, it's a big story. A lot, a lot of moving parts in it. Um, they've also announced that they're not taking on any new entrants for 2023. And those that want to get into milk in the Lakeland catchment will have to uh, send in their applications for 2024. So, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a big shift, as I said, Justin, and um, we'll have more details on, on it in the paper tomorrow. M- moves also by Glamby and the fixed milk price, Aidan, increase in the fixed milk, uh, revising it up to, is it 40 cent? In for, the for, 40 cent a litre, including VAT, um, which would be positive. I suppose for if, you know, it, it only applies to farmers that have more than 35% of their milk pool fixed in 2021. Um, and I suppose the other thing to remember in that as well is that, you, you know, in order to get that extra, you know, in many cases, 10 cent a litre, you um, you need to sign up for fixed milk price uh, for the same values for 2023 and 2024 at 38 cent a litre. Um, so farmers need to gauge there whether it's actually worth their while or not. Darn, sheep prices pushing ahead. Bit of a blip there over a couple of weeks, but prices nudging up again, 20 cent. Yeah, and look, at, uh, I suppose definitely on the spring lamb thing, just in a positive look, uh, a lot of talk last week, opening court to 7.50 a kilo. I think myself, the part of that came from factories didn't want them. They put out a court. They weren't really looking for them. It'll be small numbers what they're looking for next week. Uh, we're starting off at eight euros a kilo in the year that's in it. It's positive. Hoggett's moving on to 7.30 to 7.50, also positive. And I think this it's providing a great chance for anyone that has, say, stock that that is suitable for keeping for breeding to generate cash flow now. Adam, I'm hearing a lot of talk of, of from funny, from strange quarters of, of the collapse in the, the store trade and the store trade coming back. 
I'm following your mark bid analysis that obviously records the loss and the price of every animal or every animal sold three mark bids, uh, thousands of animals every week. And there seems to be no softening in the trade from what I can see. You, cr- you crunched the figures in the paper this week. Yeah, I guess, look, we've, we've got strength there on MarkBids, Justin, in terms of actual real-time sales data coming into us. Thousands of sale points every week through Marks all around the country. And, and yeah, there was a bit of hearsay, a bit of rumour, a bit of idle chat, I suppose, around last week saying, look, at store trade, it's fallen. Uh, we're gonna, there's going to be big issues here. But to be honest, we looked at the figures, uh, talked to a few farm mark managers, and, and that's not following through. And look, at it's the hard data, it's the facts of, of, of that MarkBids data that really tell the story. And we've tracked it for January, February, March um, through for a couple of different categories of stock, like the typical grass bred stock, 400 kilo heifers, 400 kilo steers, and they're not falling back. They're actually rising up January, February, March. And if we go back, we'll say, compare them this time last year, we're actually 25, 30 cent ahead uh, in the month of March than we were in, in March 2021. So look, it's pretty positive. Um, and I don't see in terms of, you know, that good weather coming. Um, I think we, we'll take another look. You know, the first week of April every year, and um, that's when, when when things go bananas in terms of marts, in terms of grass cattle, and I think you'll see another lift now in, in the next week or ten days. And beef trade holding firm, Adam, despite high numbers coming out. Yeah, absolutely. Kill back off the thirty nine thousand, but Justin, we're still we're still behind. I suppose the curve in terms of if we look around Europe, uh, we're still sort of bottom of that league. And even in terms of Brazil, Philip O'Neill has it tomorrow in tomorrow's paper in terms of four twenty breach and four twenty there on Monday. Uh, that's maybe due to some currency exchanges and currency strengthening, but still four twenty for Brazilian beef. And and look, at, we're we're up there. We're up at four ninety for heifers, probably top quote four eighty for for bullocks. Um, and and cows, cows are lifted to four seventy for Ugrid cows this week. An unbelievable demand. UK kill back. Nine percent so far this year, and that's really driving demand here. Adam, uh, in in terms of thirty nine thousand, there's some kill for where are we? The last week of May. Who would have yeah. forecast that? No, unbelievable. And I suppose look at that. That's really, really positive for later on in the year because we'll be I have estimated that we're up going to be up about eighty thousand in twenty twenty two, and that there was some concern towards the end of the year that all those animals are going to come on on the one at the one time, and that'll put real pressure on a beef price. If we're up thirty thousand already, and, and and factories are hungry for cattle at the moment. Look at your Easter coming around the corner, Justin, and you have a lot of promotions. Factories are in full swing at the moment, killing for Easter. A lot of promotions in supermarkets, and they'll really they'll thrive on the back of that. Um, as regards beef price, look at we're in for another couple of positive months I'd say as regards beef price Darren on the 6th of uh, April our next uh, webinar our final webinar in the in the series uh, you're in the hot seat uh, you're not bringing Adam along I note to tell him more that day because you're doing lime, Lamin Live what can we expect to see Justin Adam was in the background so he was trying to see how to make money so uh, let him <laughs> my, my, hand, my hands are too big my hands are too big <laughs> there's rumours he's bought uh, a few yos uh, Darren is there Oh, more than a few, Justin. He's uh, he'd become a he, he'd become a successful mixed grazing farmer. Yeah. Uh, what can we expect from Lamb yeah. Live, uh, Darren? Uh, look, I suppose we got two take you two from scanning uh, performance into lambing, what the uh, mortality is, what say lamb birth rates are, uh, what our management uh, during lambing, post lambing is, what are our plans for the year ahead in regards to grassland management, getting the lambs on. We'll also look a small bit at the differences between, say, sires down there. So a lot of farmers would have asked us to maybe take on supper gram as well as a texel ram. We look at is the difference in lambing difficulty, is there different in birth difference in birth rates and tease out some of that information. And look at that, that's it's a great resource to have that there. And we're thankful to Sean for putting in the effort of recording that and there'll be some nice data from it. Okay, uh, guys, that's uh, next Wednesday night, the 6th of April. Half eight again, Darren, we're kicking yep. off. Uh, half eight again, uh, yep. Half eight, uh, next Wednesday night, the 6th of April, guys. Uh, any questions and whatnot, you uh, make sure and get them into us, and we hope you can join us then. Many thanks to you for watching, for all of your questions. Uh, to my own team, Adam, Darren, and Aidan, and Sean, for for uh, for putting in the work down on the, the demo farm in Tullamore, and, of course, Traction Media, our technical team working in the background to make sure everything goes according to plan. And of course, Chanel Animal Health and Axa Farm Insurance for helping us make this happen. Until next time, ladies and gentlemen, stay safe, stay farming.